Okay, guys, so I'm going to go over chapter 68 in two parts because there's a lot of information. So this is part one, and this is all about high-risk pregnancy and childbirth, okay? So pregnancy, labor, delivery, normal physiologic processes, but complications can happen. A high-risk pregnancy is physiologic or psychological factors that increase the chances for mortality, which is death or morbidity, you know, illness of the client or the fetus. Complications related to childbirth have a really severe physical and emotional impact. So let's talk about testing. Amniocentesis. Mother must have an empty bladder. This can diagnose Down syndrome, Tay-Sachs disease, which we'll talk about later, muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, and spina bifida. It also speaks to the maturity of the fetus's lungs and the lung surfactant ratio. This involves taking a needle and under ultrasound going into the amniotic sac and drawing out amniotic fluid and sending it to the lab for evaluation. Um, there are definitely risks associated with this. Um, you know, there can be bleeding, there can be premature labor. I mean, and the risks can be significant. So they're only going to do amniocentesis when it's warranted. Everything we do, risk versus benefit. If the risk is higher than the benefit, then we're not going to do it. Benefits higher than the risk, then we are. Uh, ultrasound, these are commonly done. Mom must have a full bladder. It uses high-frequency sound waves to look inside, see the intrauterine activity, see the fetus. It can determine the gestational age of the fetus, the size of the head, location of the placenta, which is important, some fetal abnormalities. It can tell you if you have twins or triplets, multiple pregnancies, and sometimes the sex of the fetus, depending on what period of gestation the ultrasound is done. Other tests, there's, call, there's something called a contraction stress test. So what that does is we give mom some oxytocin to stimulate some uterine contractions. While she's doing that, we have the baby on a fetal heart rate monitor, and we're looking to see how the fetus is working under pressure, right? Because contractions are stress. Then there's an NST or a non-stress test, and this is either reactive or non-reactive. And that gives us information on the fetal heart rate just in response to its activity, if it's moving around, right? Non-stress test results should be reactive, which means two or more accelerations of the heart rate that peak at about 15 beats per minute above its baseline. In other words, if the baby's heart rate is 150, then the acceleration should peak at about 165 when it kicks or moves or turns over or does backflips inside mom. And that should happen within the first 20 minutes of the test. Baby's heart rate should only accelerate with movement, should never decelerate. That's when there becomes a problem. And the way we do this, we hook up a fetal heart rate monitor and we give mom this little button thing to push and she will push it every time she feels the baby move. And the results are it's either reactive or non-reactive. Then we have a fetal biophysical profile test. And that combines all these different tests together, non-stress test, ultrasound, to evaluate the fetus on a larger scale. Looks at their breathing, their movement, their tone, muscle tone, the volume of amniotic fluid, and the grade of the placenta. In other words, where is it? in relationship to its position inside the uterus. And the scores can be zero to 10. Any score below a four is a problem, okay? You need to know that. And what I did here was I gave you a little chart that explains the components of the biophysical profile. So for the non-stress test, greater than two accelerations, like I said, gives you a score of two. This breathing, if they have one episode of rhythm, rhythmic breathing that lasts greater than 30 seconds over 30 minutes, then that's a two. So in other words, the higher the score for each of these things, the better. You're shooting for a 10 because if the total score is an eight to 10, they're good. If it's a six, they're a little worried. If it's a four or below, we're very worried, okay? Um, other tests that we do, maternal serum A fetoprotein test. And that is a blood test that is a screening tool to detect the presence of fetal neural tube defects or open abdominal wall defects early in pregnancy. And this can identify myelomeningocele, spina bifida, and a meningocele, in addition to some other things. And we'll talk about 
those things coming soon. All right, let's talk about interrupted pregnancy. Okay, so there's different types. There's abortion. The word abortion means either a spontaneous or natural termination of a pregnancy or an artificial termination. A spontaneous abortion, which is also known as a miscarriage, is usually because there's something wrong with the fetus, right? A fetal abnormality. And then there are terms like threatened abortion, where mom maybe starts to bleed or spot, a complete abortion, where everything, all the contents of the uterus are expelled, a septic abortion, where there's infection, recurrent spontaneous abortion, that's people that have these miscarriages repeatedly. Inevitable abortion means there's a threatened abortion, but it looks like it's going to be a complete abortion. There's an incomplete abortion, which means that part of the contents of the uterus were expelled, but there's still some stuff left inside mom. And a missed abortion where there's still a lot of stuff in there. And it's usually, like I said, called a miscarriage. Then there's induced abortion. So medical intervention, in other words, we are terminating the pregnancy um, from a Term, from a termination of pregnancy drug perspective, two drugs, misoprostol and mifepristone are used together and that induces the abortion of the, of the termination of the pregnancy. There's also a therapeutic abortion. So in other words, if mom's life is at stake um, or the feed, fetal demise, something's going up, we, you know, we may have to medically intervene and terminate the pregnancy in order to save maybe mom's life. That's a therapeutic abortion. But there can be complications of abortion. There can be infection, sepsis, hemorrhage. If it's not done properly, it can cause sterility. That's the inability to ever have a child again. And then there's the psychological um, concern that comes after having an abortion. You know, it's not, abortion, abortion is not something that any woman goes into lightly. I mean, it's it's a very, very difficult decision to make. Um, you know, the people that are that are pro-life, and this is my opinion, doesn't reflect the opinion of AHE schools nor any of its affiliates. Um, people that are pro-life that don't believe in abortion think that women go in and have abortions just back willy-nilly. I mean, it's it's a big decision to make for women, and it carries with it a lot of psychological baggage that sometimes carries on for a long time. There can be complications, like I said. So post-abortion sepsis can kill someone. And if it doesn't kill the mom, it'll make her, make her sterile, which is a problem. So you have to make sure that the abortion is done under surgical asepsis. And it's really important that all the products of conception are removed from the uterus, right? Any fragments left in there, and that's going to cause a problem. That's going to cause a hemorrhage. Um, lots of other problems can happen, infection. And then also when the placenta separates from the wall of the uterus, it leaves these blood vessels just wide open and exposed, and that can lead to infection or hemorrhage. Okay. Okay, so now we'll start talking about other issues that can happen. An ectopic pregnancy. An ectopic means somewhere where it shouldn't be, right? So this is when a pregnancy occurs. So the mommy and daddy love each other and the sperm and the egg meet, but it implants itself somewhere other than the top third of the uterus. So there are risk factors or predisposing factors for having an ectopic pregnancy. If mom has an occlusion of her fallopian tube, having an IUD in place, an intrauterine contraceptive device, um, intrauterine tumors, PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, is a predisposing factor sometimes endocrine problems, and abnormal tubal development, right? And the symptoms are, you, you get the same, you get an HCG test that tells you you're pregnant, but there can be spotting or bleeding two to three weeks after you missed your period. And as that implanted zygote starts to grow in the wrong spot, pain. This requires surgical removal. And if it's not treated, again, this can be fatal because of either shock or hemorrhage, and, and shock would come after hemorrhage. Um, then there's something called a gestational trophoblastic disease or hydatiform mole. So this is where pregnancy happens, but the embryo dies in utero, and the chorionic villi degenerate, 
So there's little clusters in there. So at first it feels like a normal pregnancy. It looks like a normal pregnancy, but the uterus starts to get big fast. Signs, vaginal bleeding, large uterus, larger than expected. Anemia, a lot of nausea and vomiting. Signs of pregnancy-induced hypertension early on. No fetal heart rate, no fetal movement, or no palpable fetal parts. And once the diagnosis is made and we're sure, then we are going to do a dusting and cleaning, a DNC, or a dilatation and curatage. Um, and that is where we go in and dilate the cervix, go into the uterus, and scrape out the contents to make sure that everything is out. Okay? And they're going to do an HCG test follow-up. So I'm just going to pause for one second. Okay, so that is a gestational trophoblastic disease or hydatiform mole, okay? Uh, next, we have some complications of pregnancy, maternal complications. So there's lots of things that can go wrong. A perinatologist sometimes is necessary, and that is a doctor that specializes in maternal complications. Um, what is considered a high-risk pregnancy? If mom is over 35, if mom has issues prior to having become pregnant, like addiction to drugs or alcohol, smoking cigarettes, bad eating habits, pre-existing medical conditions, which we're going to talk about, um, any medical conditions that happen during pregnancy, premature labor, multiple births, placenta previa, fetal problems, preeclampsia, eclampsia, all of these things are potential complications. So first thing we'll talk about here, hyperemesis gravidarum, which is also called pernicious vomiting. We don't know why, lots of theories about it, but for whatever reason, sometimes instead of just morning sickness, there will be vomiting, 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 can't keep anything down. Weight loss, dehydration, loss of appetite, spilling acetone in the urine. Um, they're going to have some discomfort, epigastric discomfort. Um, and it's a problem because it can cause, you know, um, electrolyte imbalances, anemia, and again, very big problem for the baby, right? Because there need to be a certain amount of calories taken in every day and fluid in order for that fetus, that fetus is growing at an incredible rate of speed, okay? Just unbelievable. So it's very important that mom's able to take in, right, enough, enough nutrition. In the advanced stages of this, she can get a headache, mental aberrations, in other words, like hallucinations, delirium, jaundice, cyanosis, and even coma. I mean, it, it's if it's not treated with IV fluids, electrolytes, et cetera, mom and baby are at risk for death. Um, Pregnancy-induced hypertension, and we've talked about this, okay? And it is characterized by hypertension, edema, and proteinuria, so protein in the urine. And this can happen right during the pregnancy, after the pregnancy, and this is something a lot of people don't realize, and right before the pregnancy. And it is a major contributor to morbidity and mortality of both the mom and the baby. And then, of course, what do we do? We have to control the symptoms as much as we can. Usually mag sulfate. Um, if the blood pressure is elevated for more than 42 days after delivery, then that's chronic hypertension. And then at the six-week checkup, we're always going to be checking blood pressure, CBC, complete blood count, BUN, urine analysis, creatinine, those things. Uh, because again, hypertension, when it's sustained, will beat up the kidneys, which is why that proteinuria happens, right? So to continue on, preeclampsia, that usually happens about the 20th week of pregnancy. And the signs are... you. Three plus protein urea, protein in the urine. That's a problem. There should never be protein in the urea, in the urine. Can be a one plus or a two plus, it's worrisome, but a three plus is, oh, bad. Um, other signs of preeclampsia, hyperreflexia, right? So in other words, reflexes are really hyperactive. That increases the risk for seizures. Scotoma, which is a blind spot in the visual field. Diplopia, which is double vision, blurred vision, of course, hypertension, these are all, you know, headache is another one I'm going to add in here. If you're, if a woman's having these symptoms, it's been going on for a while, right? That's a problem. 
That's a problem. And then when we talk about the parameters, it's about a systolic that's greater than 140 and a diet or a diastolic greater than 90. Okay. So they have to have the protein urea, right? And the elevated systolic or diastolic pressure. That tells us that that's what they have. Um, let's see. Then preeclampsia, if it's not treated, can become eclampsia, which is even more serious. They will have grand mal seizures, okay? Tonic, clonic, grand mal seizures, blood pressure off the chain, and they can go into a coma. If this is happening, we're going to have to take the baby, right? Delivery as soon as possible. And when women die during childbirth, this is one of the major causes of maternal death because of circulatory collapse, a cerebral hemorrhage they can hemorrhage in their brain, or just total renal failure. And then some call minor, minor, more, not quite as major complications, but still major complications are abruptio placentae, right? The placenta is pulling away from the wall of the uterus, which is an emergency, and mom is starting to bleed, maternal hemorrhage, okay? Very dangerous. Interventions for preeclampsia or clampsia. Mag sulfate, that's the electrolyte given IV to reduce or prevent seizures and stops preterm uterine contractions. Nursing care, blood pressure should be monitored every 15 to 30 minutes um, and respiratory rate. Uh, blood pressure for decrease and, and respiratory rate every 15 minutes. Why? Because of the fact that it affects the nerves, magnesium sulfate is going to suppress all the nerve activity, right, which will affect respirations and it'll affect blood pressure, okay? While they're receiving mag sulfate, continuous fetal heart rate monitoring should be done. And then when we're looking for toxicity symptoms, hyporeflexia, deep tendon reflexes are either absent, not there, or just sluggish. Oliguria, which is no urine output or less than 30 mils. And I'm going to put that here. That would be less than 30 mils per hour, right? Um, and diplopia, which is double vision, right? The antidote, calcium gluconate, right? Everybody's got that one. All right. Um, a client with severe preeclampsia should lie on her back as much as possible. You think that's true or do you think that's false? What do you think lying on your back does? It's not good. So she should lie on her left side because this helps with renal circulation, takes pressure off the aorta and the vena cava, and it also helps circulation for the fetus. So left lateral. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about gestational diabetes. Di gestational diabetes is not diabetes mellitus. It is its own thing that occurs during pregnancy. And most of the time after that baby is delivered, sugars return to normal. However, sometimes they will develop type one, mm, type two diabetes. I'm not going to say type one, type two diabetes later on because you don't develop type one diabetes, right? So um, how do we test for it? The oral glucose tolerance test. And this is done for pregnant women, and this can be done for non-pregnant people too. And you fast, right? Blood sugar's checked. They drink a liquid that's loaded with carbohydrates. Blood sugar's checked one hour and two hours later, okay? And what are we looking for? Less than 140, normal. 141 to 200, pre-diabetic. Greater than 200, they are diabetic. So we are going to... I like this right here. Okay, so make sure you know that. And gestational diabetes carries with it a high risk for macrosomia, which is a large for gestational age baby. And a macrosomic newborn, usually hypoglycemic, and they usually weigh more than nine pounds. Okay, important to know. And here's some important facts that you should know also. I'm going to highlight all of this. Gestational diabetes, those patients should always have snacks. They should, small frequent meals, small frequent meals, small frequent meals, small frequent meals. Maintains the blood sugar at a stable level throughout the day. The last snack before they go to bed should be a protein and a complex carb. 
right? And that helps prevent them from bottoming out during the night. Blood glucose schedules, okay? They're different for every person, okay? But usually, typically, first thing in the morning, a fasting, right before bed, and usually it's before each meal. If they're going to exercise, they should do it after a meal because this way they've got some additional sugars, carbs in their system to prevent them from getting hypoglycemic or bottoming out. And clients with gestational diabetes need about 2,000 calories a day, okay? So that's about 35 calories per kilogram of body weight per day. And that makes sure that they're getting enough glucose and preventing hypoglycemia from occurring, okay? And we're not going to talk about diabetes mellitus existing disorders. We're going to stop it right here. And if you have any questions so far, now's the time. All right, guys. Uh, I will do part two of this video next. Peace out.